The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello. Welcome to today's SFP Perspective Webinar, Fire Protection of Sloped Combustible Attic Spaces. This is Victoria Valentine, SFPE's Director of Professional Qualifications and Industry Alliances, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is sponsored by Globe Fire Sprinkler Corporation, but before we get started, I'm going to review some of the specifics. First of all, participants, all participants who are SFPE members will receive a certificate of attendance for one PDH. To receive the certificate, you must stay online for the entire webinar. Certificates will be sent out via email in about a week. Also, we do not provide copies of the speaker's PowerPoint presentations. However, we will be posting a video of this presentation on the SFPE's YouTube channel and website in the next week. Additionally, you can ask our speaker questions by writing in the webinar dashboard. You can ask a question anytime. However, we will handle questions at the end of the webinar. Today's speaker is Kevin Mon, Vice President of New Technology for Globe Fire Sprinkler Corporation. Kevin joined Globe in January 2016. He has served 13 years as a sprinkler designer and design manager before beginning employment with Central Sprinkler Company in 1994 as a technical services representative and later as director of technical services. He has previously been manager of product applications with Tyco. Kevin assisted in the development of and instructed at Tyco Fire and Building Products training seminars held at the Research and Development Center in Rhode Island. He has given numerous lectures and technical presentations on new technologies for fire sprinkler professionals across the country. He is a committee member for NFPA 24 and has previously served on the NFPA 13, 14, and NFPA 80. He is NYSET certified and has served as an alternate member on the NFSA Engineering and Standards Committee and on the American Fire Sprinkler Association's Technical Advisory Committee. Kevin has over 36 years experience in the fire protection industry, and we are glad to have Kevin with us. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Kevin, and I'll come back with questions later on. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Um, yeah, that's, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'd also like to thank everybody for joining in today. Um, I, I want to add to that introduction. Um, she had mentioned that I was uh, involved in design uh, for 13 years. So I've had my share of uh, attic sprinkler uh, design um, projects over the years. Now this goes back to well before they made changes to the NFPA additions. Uh, but then what was interesting is in 1994, I went ahead and left the contracting and design side of the business and uh, began working for Central Sprinkler Company out in Pennsylvania, um, which was very eye-opening. Uh, Central Sprinkler Company, for those of you that are familiar with Central Sprinkler Company back in the day, they were they were pretty much uh, they had a reputation for uh, new innovative products at the time. And when I started in April of 1994 out at Central, their uh, current new innovative product that they were just coming out with was something that was called the specific application back to back sprinkler, which is completely different than anything that we had ever seen at the time. So my job at Central Sprinkler was uh, in the technical services department. So from 1994, we actually introduced it in 1995. Uh, eventually, Central was purchased by Tyco in 2000. Uh, but from 1995 until about 2016, I've been um, supporting the, uh, the original specific application attic sprinkler uh, for 20 plus years. So I have a little bit of familiarity with, these, uh, with attic construction, uh, specific applications of addicts. Um, so I just want to give you that little bit of background. So today what I'm going to talk about, we're going to, we're going to talk about a little bit about the challenges of protecting addicts, first of all. But I've got this presentation set up into sort of two halves. First half is going to be the challenges of protecting addicts just in general uh, due to their construction type. Uh, the second half, or the last third of the presentation, I want to um, uh, introduce the, uh, a new addict protection scheme that's different from even those those newer specific application back to back attic schemes. Um, so so that's how I'm going to set this presentation up. I do have a disclaimer though. As of this moment uh, of this PowerPoint presentation, our UL listing for this new scheme is still not final. It's pending. We do not anticipate any major changes whatsoever. 
whatsoever. It's mostly uh, paperwork issues. Um, hopefully any day now, uh, we've been saying that for a little while, but hopefully any day now we'll have uh, the final listing. Uh, but I do have to make that uh, statement with this presentation. We are done with all fire tests, all mechanicals and whatnot. All right, so the topics of discussion and the agenda for this, I wanna talk a little bit about attic terminology. Uh, not that I don't think you, most people listening in understand the terminology for attics, especially if we deal with attics uh, quite often, but I have a little bit of a spin to the attic terminology. And I look at it as, as it relates to how heat flows and the you know, hot gases, the movement of hot gases in, in, in attics. Okay, so I, you know, I wanna talk about that, touch on that a little bit. Uh, then we get into the challenges of protecting attics. We want to talk about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about fire testing uh, that had been done previously and how that fire testing resulted in some pretty substantial NFPA 13 changes to how you protect attics uh, in accordance with the um, prescriptive uh, uh, design parameters of NFPA 13. Um, <clears throat> then we'll get into eventually down at the end of this presentation, the last third, we'll get into the new attic, uh, globe attic protection uh, scheme. I'm going to do fairly high level overview of that, and I'm not going over each you know, page of the data sheet. But in the hour, hour of time that we have, um, I think I'll be able to go ahead and give you a really good uh, uh, concept of what this new attic protection scheme is. And then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So attic terminology. So we're going to take a look at this uh, uh, figure of an attic roof. So first of all, your peaks and ridges, I think we're all familiar with that. That's your horizontal, I look at those as your horizontal points of maximum heat trap. No matter where a fire develops underneath this roof, the hot gases, the ceiling jets, everything wants to make its way to these horizontal points of heat trap. They all want to work their way eventually to these peaks and ridges. Then you bring in your hips. Hips, again, are, um, they're also points of heat trap, but the nature of a hip is, a hip line is that it's sloped also. It's not horizontal, it's sloped. So I look at these, um, these hip lines as, as uh, again, a, a point of heat trap, and it's sort of like the on-ramp to my highway. It, it's where the heat's going, but it's traveling somewhere else. It's hopping on to the, the on-ramp and then working its way up to the, to the peak or the ridge. And then you have your valleys. Valleys are just the opposite. Valleys are sort of your inverted V, and what's going to happen in a valley is if you've got a fire below a valley, what's going to happen with the hot gases? It's going to move away from your valleys. Okay, so in this figure here, you can see that if the fire starts directly below a, a valley, you're probably going to split, split the heat, and again, it's going to work its way up towards the uh, peaks and uh, ridges. And then you have your uh, eaves out at the perimeter of the attic. Now, the reason I want to talk about this a little bit is, well, I think... You know, NFPA 13 does a great job of trying to address as many situations that you might come across in the built environment, in, in, you know, project to project. And then the specific application uh, data sheets of these newer attic sprinklers, they all do a good job of trying to cover as many scenarios as possible. But with that said, it never fails that there will be some area from project to project where it's just not covered either in the specific uh, the, the NFPA uh, prescriptive standard or in any of those specific application data sheets. We just can't possibly cover every scenario. So that's where I say that once you understand what's happening, when you get to those gray areas where it's not exactly covered in the standard or in a specific application data sheet, uh, when you get to those gray areas, I think it's important to understand you know, what's happening, what's the dynamics of hot gases, movement uh, within these, these attic structures. And once you understand that and you're, you're informed on that, then you can make a pretty good judgment or decision as to how to handle that quote unquote gray area. So that's why I think this is important to understand. And we'll get into it a little bit more as we go through the presentation. All right, this next slide shows uh, a typical uh, hip roof framing area. And I wanna talk about this because when I look at the NFPA uh, prescriptive standard, it really doesn't differentiate between how you lay out sprinklers and the, 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 the um, design method of your sprinklers that are underneath the gable portion of your roof versus the hip portion of your roof. And there are some major differences on the dynamics of heat collection uh, under these, these uh, hip roofs. 
So we're going to take a look at this is a very, very common uh, hip roof uh, stru structure right here. So what I want to look at is the step down hip trusses. So you have your trusses that are running along the gable portion of your roof, running up to the peak from one eave and then down to down, sloping back down to the opposing eave on the other side, all the way along the ridge. But as those trusses work their way, the building works its way towards the hip roof. Obviously, what starts to happen is your I'm only showing the top cord here. Your your uh, hip trusses will flatten out across the hip roof, and then on the op opposing hip side, it'll slope back down to the other E. And then these step down as they continue forward. You step down, flattens out, steps down, flattens out, and finally steps down again, and flattens out. Um, and then what's happening here is typically at, at um, as they near the E, what you're going to have is you're going to see these what we call jack trusses that are now framed perpendicular to the hip truss. Okay, so you have these jack trusses coming from the eave up and framed into the, the hip trusses. So I want to talk about this just a little bit in, in the dynamics of uh, hot gas collection and, air, and uh, heat movement through this area. So over here, if I had a fire that starts down by the eave under the, let's call it the gable area of the roof, uh, channeling uh, effect right up to the peak, tight channeling, and that heat's going to run right up to the peak, right? If I have a fire that starts down lower towards the corner over here, again, you're going to have a channeling effect where the heat's being channeled. But then it hits the rear or the hip line. And what's it going to do? It's going to turn and it's going to travel along the hip line. And where's it going? It's going back up to that ridge point or that maximum point of heat trap. And it eventually wants to migrate up to that peak or the ridge. Same thing if the fire started under this hip roof, but down towards the corner, you're going to have a channeling effect because you've got those jack trusses there that are two foot on the center. And the, the hot gas is going to move up and then take that turn at the uh, hip line and then run up to the ridge. Now, if I had a fire start way out over here, down by the E, right, um, in between the jack trusses, Again, you're going to have tight channeling of the hot gases between those two jack trusses. These top cords could be two by fours or they could be two by sixes. But what's going to happen here is once it hits, once it you know, rises up and hits that first hip truss, it's going to want to try to roll under the hip truss. But because of the slope of the roof, it still wants to work its way up towards the peak, right? But now because of the channels, the different direction in the channels, not only is it still rolling, trying to roll up towards the peak, it's also spreading itself a little bit more laterally, right? So you have a little bit of a different dynamic once you get up into that area than you do down at the area where those jack trusses are, where it's much tighter of a, a, a channeling of the hot gases, okay? And that really does come into play with our new, um, with our new protection scheme, all right? You will see as I get into our slides that we have a row of sprinklers our first row of sprinklers that's running across this hip area down toward the eave, we're going to limit the spacing of those sprinkler heads to approximately eight feet max on center. We want to keep them fairly tight because we know the heat's channeling typically in between these jack trusses. But then the adjacent lines of sprinklers or adjacent rows of sprinklers moving up that hip roof, uh, we can afford to spread our sprinklers apart a little bit more because of what's happening with the hot gases. Right? Remember, they're going to spread a little bit more. They're going to channel a little bit laterally as well as continue to move its way up. So we'll talk about that a little bit later when I get to our, um, our particular scheme. But keep that in mind. So for challenges of protecting attics, it all comes down to channeling and then the slope nature of these attics. So those two factors really affect how, we, uh, how, how effective we are in protecting these attics. Now I talk about hips, valleys, and ridges. I used to look at those as uh, hindrances to my sprinkler design. Now, what, what we've learned is we could take those and actually um, use them to our benefit. If you know what they're, what they're doing and what they're doing to the hot gases, why not use them to our benefit and utilize that, utilize that in our design scheme? Okay, on here, I still I have a last bullet point that talks about the 1.2 rule. For any of you designers out there, um, the 1.2 rule, I just want to mention this because this is the rule that tells you how many sprinklers on a branch line 
that you should simulate might open in a fire. So if a fire starts below a branch line and the direction of growth of that fire happens to be along that branch line, you're going to open multiple sprinklers along that branch line. So the NSTA 1.2 rule is there to make sure that you calculate or you simulate a reasonable amount of sprinklers might operate along that branch line and that those branch lines are sized, the piping is sized large enough to carry the amount of water if you're opening five, six, or seven sprinklers along that branch line. That's what the 1.2 rule is all about. So I have a question here. Does the 1.2 rule make sense in attic construction? I'll let you guys think about that just for a second. I believe it does not, and I'll tell you why. So we're gonna take a look at this figure. <clears throat> at the bottom of the figure is a peak. Okay, this is gonna be a sloped roof. The high point is at the bottom of the figure, uh, the peak. The uh, top of the figure would be, would be my eaves. Uh, those vertical black lines you see would be representing uh, trusses two foot on center, okay, members. Typically in an attic, we're going to run our branch lines perpendicular through those trusses so we can hang our pipe. Um, so what happens in these attic constructions is that, again, getting back to the channeling effect, so I'm gonna take a look at the fire source uh, shown up here at the top of the figure by the eaves, right? So if I have a fire that starts between those two sprinklers, those two sprinklers are approximately 10 feet apart right now. If I have a fire that starts between those two sprinklers, the channeling effect of these uh, web or the top cord members will keep that hot gas uh, very, very tight. This is not a horizontal ceiling that we might see in a regular office building where you can expect uh, the hot gas uh, movement to be you know, basically a 360 degree pattern off of that fire source. No, this is totally different. It's sloping up and it's channeled because of the construction and the structural members. So you'll be lucky if you get hot gases moving beyond one or two channels, okay? And the challenge here is those sprinklers that you see that are on either side of that fire source, they're 10 feet apart, five feet from the source. The challenge is getting those two sprinklers to operate. And that's been very, very difficult. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the fire testing we did and what we saw. Um, now, this is where I also wanna talk about the 1.2 rule. I show that critical distance, that critical distance in those two directions as I move forward in this presentation, we're going to call that the distance uh, that's perpendicular to the slope of this roof. Okay, so left to right here is perpendicular to the slope of the roof. It's sloping down from the peak, right? And that's the critical distance. So here's where I want to talk about the 1.2 rule. So I can tell you that in our fire test, now they'll move that fire source around. The UL will try to find the absolute worst position they can find for the uh, fire source during these uh, special tests. But I can tell you during our test, I don't believe we ever operated more than one sprinkler under the sloped roof that was next to that fire source. Now, once the heat gets up to the peak and then it turns and runs along the peak, sure, you're going to operate multiple sprinklers along the peak because now the heat's gathering up there and collecting. So down along the slope and underneath the slope roof and with these channels, you are, are lucky if you get two sprinklers to operate down along that area. So the 1.2 rule would tell me in this configuration would say, hey, you've got to calculate or simulate that five, six, or seven sprinklers possibly, depending on whether it's a wet system, dry system. You've got to simulate that five, six, or seven sprinklers are, may open along that branch line. And again, under a horizontal ceiling, that's maybe reasonable because the fire may grow in that direction and you wanna make sure that you size the pipe large enough. But in this scenario, it's just unreasonable. There's no reason, when I know that I'll be lucky if I operate two of those sprinklers, that I should be counting six, seven, or you know, five, six, or seven of those sprinklers. It just doesn't seem reasonable to me. Okay, so I wanna show a video here. Uh, this is out at our Standish, uh, Michigan um, facility uh, last summer. We poured an 80-foot wide by 120-foot long concrete pad. Within a week, we had a our, our uh, test attic built. And you can see it being built here on the top left. The figure on the bottom, the picture on the bottom right shows the other end where we had our hip roof down at that end. And again, we framed it exactly like you saw in that earlier slide. We want to make things as realistic as possible. 
So I'm going to go ahead and show you a video, but let me set it up first a little bit. This was probably the very first fire we ran in that attic test structure, all right? Um, UL was not there for this. This was more for us collecting data. So which, let me set it up for you here a little bit. What you're looking at um, is a wood crib, typical UL wood crib, which sits on top of a pan of heptane. This is gonna be your fire source, right? You can see like a, it looks like a wire crossing that channel. And then there are three rods on that wire. What we did was we attached uh, thermocouples to those rods. We attached three thermocouples to each rod, one at the top, one about in the middle of the rod, and then one at the bottom of the rod. And then we have three rods. So what we were doing here, well, this is data collection. We're just taking temperature profiles. So we have a total of nine thermocouples across that channel at different elevations, and then to the left of the channel, in the middle of the channel, and to the right of the channel. We did the same thing with the, the adjacent channel to the right, and the same thing with the adjacent channel to the left. So this is all about data collection for us. You can see a piece of pipe that's su supplying a sprinkler over here in the adjacent channel to the right of this crib. That's a 200 degree quick response sprinkler. That is not part of what our specific application new scheme is. We just placed that sprinkler there for some more data points, right? And that sprinkler is located approximately 12, 12 inches below the deck. It's two feet lateral and a couple of feet in, in towards the peak uh, away from that crib. So with that said, let's take a quick look at this video. Now this is an eight minute long video, but I'm gonna jump ahead. Uh, I just wanted to let you see what channeling looks like in these attics. This attic structure was a three and 12 uh, pitched attic. Uh, we've since uh, have some different trusses up there now uh, built for some further testing that we're running. So they've begun the fire. I'm gonna move ahead. The top cords are two by sixes in these trusses. You may see two by sixes or two by four top cords. Uh, in, in either case, you still have this channeling uh, effect that you see here happening. I'm gonna move ahead a little bit further. We are four and a half minutes into the fire. Now we're five and a half in. I'm gonna move it on to over six minutes into the fire. Now you start to get rollover to the adjacent channels. You got hot gases collecting in the adjacent channels. This sprinkler again was two feet away, 12 inches down, has not operated yet. We're almost seven minutes in. Now we're a little over seven minutes. And again, now you're seeing rollover into the adjacent channels. And still the major, the majority of this plume is being channeled up that initial uh, uh, channel where the fire uh, began. So that sprinkler has not operated yet. Yep, it's live and there is water in that pipe. And keep an eye on it. There we go. Seven minutes and 47 seconds minus a few seconds when, when the video started. So that sprinkler, which was two feet lateral and a couple of feet in towards the peak from that fire source, took about seven minutes and 20 seconds to operate. I have another video I was going to show, but in the interest of time, if we can get back to this, I'll go, I'll go back to this video. But what I wanted to show you there was just uh, the impact of channeling and what happens. So the fire doesn't spread laterally, it just runs right up to the peak or to the ridge. So we gotta deal with those challenges and how do we address those? All right, so the next section of this, I wanna talk about fire testing that was done back in, I'm gonna say back in 2001, I believe, um, out at UL. This testing resulted in some really substantial changes to NFPA 13 and how designers had to lay out their systems um, in accordance with NFPA 13. So this is the UL attic test structure that you're looking at here. There was a series of six tests run. I'm only going to talk about test number four at the moment. So if you take a look at test number four, the sprinkler spacing was 10 foot by 12 foot. It was uh, 12 foot up the slope, 
and 10 foot perpendicular to the slope. That was that, that critical direction I was talking about. Okay, so these sprinklers are 10 foot away in that direction. Uh, there's plastic ridge vents. Uh, all of these tests we run now, they have to be pretty realistic, so they do require that we put in a, a ridge vent. Um, this test was, uh, the test or the crib was situated between two sprinklers down by the eaves. But what's really interesting to see here is they ran these tests at a 20 PSI minimum pressure from the sprinklers, right? So back in the day, um, before these tests were, were done, my design uh, calculations for an attic would only require seven PSI at a sprinkler. That was it. Every sprinkler needed to have at least seven PSI. In this particular test, they bumped it up to 20 PSI, so almost three times what I normally would design my system for. So what's 20 PSI out of a half inch orifice K5.6 sprinkler? That's gonna be 25 gallons per minute. That sprinkler is spaced at 120 square feet, 10 foot by 12 foot, that's 120 square feet. So 120 square feet with 25 gallons per minute, you're looking at an applied density of 0.21 gallons per minute per square foot. What's an attic require? A light hazard attic typically requires a minimum 0.10 gallons per minute per square foot. So this particular test, they basically ran it at an ordinary hazard type density, all right? Double, double the standard density for an attic. So now we take a look at a plan view of the, uh, um, this particular uh, test, test number four. Sprinkler number one and sprinkler number two in the middle of this figure are directly below the peak, right? Sprinkler number three and sprinkler number four are down by the E. You can see the location of the crib between those two sprinklers, all right? Um, let's take a look at sprinkler number one. Uh, let's look at sprinkler number two, first of all. The first sprinkler to operate was sprinkler number two. It took three minutes and 19 seconds after ignition. Sprinkler number one operated about five seconds later. When was the next sprinkler to operate in this test? Sprinkler number four, which was five foot laterally. Remember that uh, the, the, the video I just showed, we were only about two foot laterally. It took about seven minutes, seven and a half minutes. But in this test, sprinkler number four took 16 and a half minutes to operate. Sprinkler number three did not operate. At the same time, if you take a look at the light hashed area uh, on this figure, that's representing burn through of the uh, uh, roof deck. So that completely burned through during this test. And again, remember, these sprinklers were putting out 20 PSI, or almost three times the amount of pressure that I would need normally for a sprinkler design for an attic uh, structure. Some photos of this particular fire test, two, just over two minutes into the test, no sprinklers had operated. A little over eight minutes into the test, you had your two upper sprinklers at the ridge operate, but you had not had any operation from your lower sprinklers which were closer to the ignition source. A little over nine minutes into the test, you're starting to see burn through and breach. Still, we have not operated those lower sprinklers, which are adjacent to the crib. And then at 14 minutes into the test, again, burn through. And at that point, you still had not had any operation of those lower sprinklers. They didn't remember test, uh, sprinkler number four operated at, uh, what, 16 and a half minutes. This is looking at uh, some photos of the burn through damage. This is looking down from, from the eave up to the peak, and you're looking from the channel where the wood crib was. A few other uh, views of the burn through of this structure. Okay, so what did all of that result in? That test, those tests were done in 2001. So that resulted in some changes which were first seen in the 2002 edition of NFTA 13, and they're there today still. And one of the major changes of that uh, test series was that we now require a row of sprinklers within 12 inches of the peak laterally, either 12, feet to 12 inches left or 12 inches to the right of the peak, and no more than 12 inches down from the peak to the deflector. And you gotta understand that up until this point, I was allowed to install my highest level of sprinklers at 36 inches, up to 36 inches below the peak. So what I would normally do was, I measure directly down 36 inches from the peak, draw a horizontal line, and then I would spot, let me see if I can show this on this slide. I'd measure down 36 inches, come across horizontally, and I'd spot a row of sprinklers, my first row of sprinklers way over here somewhere, down over in this area, probably right about there. I would do the same thing under this other slope group over here. 
right? So that left a big, big void area up in here. I think what we've learned is we just can't afford to do that. That's the maximum point of heat trap. We need to get some sprinklers up in that area. One of the other changes they uh, made here was you can see the sprinklers down uh, off the eaves, coming up off the eaves. They now want at least a minimum of five foot up from the eaves. They don't want people tucking those sprinklers down in the eaves because if you had a fire that started maybe a foot or two to the right of that into the attic, uh, chances of you operating those sprinklers that were tucked down in the eaves are, are minimal. All right, so that was one of their other changes. So this is the table you'll look at. Uh, it's in the 2016 edition of NFPA 1386221, and it basically tells you for light hazard occupancies with different construction types, here is what the spacing is and the maximum coverage area of your sprinklers. So in this case for attics, we're looking at this area down here, a combustible concealed space in accordance with 86414. What does that section say? Basically, it tells you that for combustible concealed attic structures with mem combustible members three foot or less on center and slopes greater than uh, 412 or greater, you've got to follow these rules. All right, those rules are 120 square foot max per sprinkler. But then over here under the maximum spacing, this was a big change here. Under the maximum spacing, you'll see that there's a 15 foot uh, allowed distance parallel to the slope. And that's the direction, you know, going up the slope. And you saw how quick those, uh, that, 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 those hot gases channeled up the slope. So there's no problem with putting your sprinklers further up in that direction. The critical dimension was that next number, 10 feet perpendicular to the slope, right? That was that critical direction from left to right of the crib that we were looking at. But then there's a little asterisk here. What does that mean? I go down to the note, it says C864144. What does that say? That's the part that tells me, hey, we'll let you be up to 10 feet now. Now, remember, before this change, I could, if I wanted to, I could locate my sprinklers 15 feet apart, perpendicular to the slope. I was allowed to do that. But this change brought me back to only 10 feet max. Okay. But then this is the section that says, we'll let you go 10 feet. But if you're more than eight feet in that direction, we're going to require that you calculate your system at a minimum of 20 PSI per sprinkler. And now you know where that came from. That came from that particular test, number four, that we were just looking at. So that was run at 20 PSI. Now, those results you saw, there was burn through there. I, apparently, that was a success, successful test. But um, um, I'm not sure that was uh, something I really want to design uh, with, with that type of burn through. So anyway, this is where over eight feet up to 10 feet, you're required to uh, calculate your sprinklers at a minimum of 20 PSI. So what, you know what that does? That limits every designer to not spacing those sprinklers more than eight feet. Because if I have to run my cal calculations at 20, 20 PSI, my system demand is going to skyrocket. I think it's just too much. So uh, in a nutshell, here are the changes. We now uh, require sprinklers at 12 inches from the peak. Um, they dropped us from 120 square or 130 square foot to 120. And there's that little section that says, hey, if you're up to eight foot perpendicular to the slope, we'll let you calculate seven PSI minimum. If you're over eight feet up to the maximum 10 now, uh, you're going to be required to calculate your system at 20 PSI per sprinkler. All right. So let's take all those rules. Here's, here's a particular uh, attic structure. My wife uh, designed sprinkler systems for 30 plus years, this is the project I think she had. Um, and so what we did was we laid out a system in accordance with the new, with those NFPA uh, prescriptive guidelines. So I'm gonna take a first look at all my peaks, all my horizontal peaks and ridges. So remember, we had to have a row of sprinklers essentially below the peak or the ridge. So there's your branch lines that are running right below the peaks and the ridge. Um, you see a lot of little dormers built here. Some of those dormers are built on top of your uh, main sheathing. Um, so let, let me look at this here. What we tried to do as we laid out this system with the, the, the guidelines and the rules of the prescriptive standard was I tried to get away with just two rows of sprinklers, these rows of sprinklers and branch lines you see here. I tried to get away with just two rows of sprinklers between the peak and the E. But because of my spacing rules and how far I could uh, space on the slope, I couldn't make it work. I was just a little bit overspaced. So that required me to add a, an additional branch line in. And now I've got three branch lines on either side of the peak, okay, underneath the slope roof. Addition, 
directionally. The distance perpendicular to the slope, remember we talked about the 10 foot max. Well, I didn't want to go any more than eight foot because I don't want to get hammered on my hydraulic calc for the 20 PSI. So I laid these out so they were maximum, maximum eight foot between sprinklers, all right? So what does that result in? Now what happened is, even though I'm allowed to space my sprinklers uh, for 120 square foot coverage area, these sprinklers, just because of the rules, I get, I get cornered a little bit, and just because of the rules, I ended up being about 85 square feet on the average per sprinkler, not 120 square feet. And that's just how it works sometimes with these, um, these attic structures. You just can't take advantage of the maximum spacing that's allowed. So that ended up uh, throwing me into 425 sprinklers for this particular attic. Um, with the old rules, I probably would have been able to get away with about 300 sprinklers in this attic. Additionally, the NFPA's prescriptive criteria requires uh, a minimum, what, what they call hydraulic design area, or a, a simulated area, uh, what they would expect it, you, that sprinklers may operate in during a fire. So for a dry system, which this was, my hydraulic design area, or the area that I have to simulate sprinklers have, might operate in during a fire, is just over 2,500 square feet. So I'm taking this area over here, which is rather my hydraulically remote area, this is about 2,500 square feet. And because I could not take advantage of my maximum spacing, and I was only at about 85 square foot per sprinkler, I ended up with 39 sprinklers in my hydraulic design area. So 39 sprinklers at 7 PSI, which is roughly 15 gallons per minute, equates to a system demand of 585 gallons per minute. And that's without over discharging. Uh, over discharging due to friction loss, you're going to be well over 600 gallons per minute system demand on this layout. So 425 sprinklers, 600 plus gallons per minute. It's just really taxing on a sprinkler designer and also on the um, available water supplies. All right, so that's some of the issues and some of the challenges we face with uh, current attic protection. So let's take a look at how we try to address some of this stuff. So. What I'm gonna call phase one rollout of our new attic protection scheme, uh, I think a lot of people uh, have seen the, the single line back-to-back -back specific application schemes, which again, I supported for the last 20 plus years, so I'm very familiar with those. But we wanted to try to um, see if we could come out with this first rollout and, and, and try to see if we can make a difference on system demands. Because even those back-to-back -back, uh, design schemes, um, you know, they're meant to run one line underneath the peak or the ridge, and then those sprinklers, those back-to-back -back sprinklers, are intended to be able to spray all the way out to the east on either side. A great concept, absolutely great concept. But they do require a little bit of pressure and a little bit of water, right, uh, to be able to do that. So even though they're not approaching the 500 or 600 gallon per minute system demands, uh, they've improved on that quite a bit, but they're down to, you know, still looking at around 300 to 350 gallon per minute demands to be able to make that work, okay? And one of the things that I found over the years in supporting the back-to-back -back sprinkler was we had a lot of guys that would call us up and say, I want to use your, your, you know, this technology, but I just don't have the supply to make, you know, to, to, to feed that back-to-back -back sprinkler to cover the whole width all the way out to the east. So one of the things they would do, a lot of them would do, is they would take that back-to-back -back sprinkler and they would use it, instead of covering out to 60 feet, which they were listed for, at least over at Central and at Tyco, I think uh, Reliable has one, I think, out to 70 feet now. But instead of being able to, instead of using it for its full coverage area, because they couldn't make that work hydraulically, what they would do is they'd, they'd reduce the coverage area of the back-to-back -to, -back to about 40 feet in width. Okay? And then what they would do is they'd run uh, an additional line of sprinklers down towards the east on either side. So instead of one row of back-to-backs that covered everything, you still were looking at three rows of sprinklers. And they had to do that in some cases for those supplies that just, you know, weren't good enough to, to supply that single row of back-to-backs and, and be able to cover all the way down to the east. So what we're, we're trying to do here is find a, a way to where we can reduce the uh, system demands. Yes, it's not a single row. Uh, as you can see in that uh, uh, figure to the left there, you, should, you see a row of uh, sprinklers underneath the peak, 
And then you see a row of sprinklers, uh, what I'm going to call our downslope or DS sprinklers, down along each of the slope roofs, okay, pointing out towards the east. So that's our, our intent right now. We are working on a back-to-back. -back. We will have that, it looks like uh, probably late summer. So what we want to do is provide a tool or a scheme for either situation. If somebody has decent to good water supply and water pressure, by all means, go with the back-to-back. -back. Uh, we'll have a back-to-back -back hopefully late summer. Go ahead and do that. But for those supplies that don't, you know, aren't good enough to be able to handle that, uh, we want to be able to have another tool because they can't even go back to the prescriptive standard because that's five or 600 gallons permitted in that. So these people get caught in the middle there and it's really, really difficult. So our scheme, uh, we are done with all of our fire testing. Hopefully we'll have this listing finalized in a, by the end of the month at the latest, I hope. But our scheme is looking at 100 gallon per minute demand for a wet system and 120 gallon per minute demand for a dry system. So you can compare that to a 300 to 500 plus system de demand for uh, uh, either prescriptive, the prescriptive method or even some of those, uh, those specific application methods right now. Um, this design scheme utilizes two different sprinklers. They both have 5.6K factors. And the nice thing about this, when you're running your hydraulic calcs, the hydraulic calcs are based on a 20 GPM, a fixed flow and a fixed pressure per sprinkler. So it's 20 GPM per sprinkler. It doesn't matter which sprinkler it is, and it doesn't matter what the spacing is. It's always 20 GPM. And this makes things quite a bit easier when designers are trying to determine what their hydraulically most demanding sprinklers are. In this case, it's the same flow, same pressure, same K factor. You just got to find your hydraulically most demanding five or six sprinklers. We would hope that this would reduce pipe sizing fairly dramatically. Uh, most of these systems are dry, so you're going to have a dry pipe valve. We would hope that this would drop that to two inch to two and a half inch dry pipe valves instead of four inch. Um, and so I think it's all in all, uh, it could be very, very economical. These are the two sprinklers that we're looking at. We're going to call this one on the left the RE sprinkler, which is used under the ridge. It's also used down by the eaves, if need be, and it is also used under the hip roof. So its full name is the GL-SS slash RE, first, middle, and last name. I'm going to refer to that as the RE from here on out. Then you have your other sprinkler that's used on the downslope areas. That's the GLSS DS. We're going to refer to that as the DS from here on out. And that's used, as you saw in that one figure, downslope of the peak. Okay, it's got a 20-foot throw out to the eaves. We've got a little bit of a back throw to it. It can also be used uh, adjacent to some of the hip areas, and I'll show that in a second. So the overview, light hazard, concealed attic spaces. And I want to emphasize these are only for concealed attic spaces and cannot be used in occupied areas, such as church, vaulted ceilings of churches and whatnot. These are only for use in concealed attic spaces. The pitch, we're looking at a 3 and 12 minimum pitch up to a 7 and 12 right now. Um, we're you know shooting for something beyond that later on, but three and twelve to seven and twelve. I found that the majority of the attics I dealt with during the twenty years of uh, support of the attics sprinkler fell within that area anyway. Pitch. Uh, the sweet spot as far as the uh, maximum span, uh, that last bullet point, seventy-two feet in uh, width for the maximum span. I think that's going to be the sweet spot there. That would allow you to use one row underneath the peak. That's those RE sprinklers as well as one row under each slope of those downslope sprinklers. Those downslope sprinklers, can, again, can spray up to 20 feet out to the east. People have asked about CTVC. Are you going to have any listings with CTVC? Yes, we have tested for uh, use with CTVC. Obviously, that would have to be wet systems, and that would be for both feeding the sprinklers below the ceiling, as well as feeding the actual attic sprinklers up in the attic. So we are looking at um, uh, being allowed to be able to use listed, UL listed CPVC. Uh, as long as it's a UL listed CPVC, we should be fine. All right, so let me just uh, show a few pages from the data sheet. Again, I'm not going to go over every page of the data sheet, but I want to say this. Uh, what happened when we first developed the attic sprinkler over at Central? That was an eight-page data sheet when we developed a specific application attic sprinkler. That data sheet has now evolved to at least 28 
pages. And that's fine. That was over the years we, we took information in from the contractors and the built environment and we continued to add to that data sheet. But eventually what happened is we just kept adding and tacking on and adding and adding. And before we knew it, we just had this enormous 28 page data sheet. And I, I really, looking back at it, I wish I would have been able to go back and maybe wish we would have been able to reorganize it a little bit better. Here we have the opportunity to do that because we were starting from scratch here at Globe. So this was our opportunity to organize the data sheet in a more user-friendly method, I thought, coming from an ex-designer's perspective. So what you look at, what you're seeing here is you'll you'll see we've separated the areas of the attic into ridge line, downslope, hip. And for each of those areas, we have a separate page which is going to give you all of the pertinent information for that particular sprinkler being installed in that area. And as you can see in this figure on the left here, we're only talking about the shaded area here. That's your ridgeline area. And you can see that the width of that ridgeline area extends 12 feet horizontally to both sides of the peak. So a total of 24 foot wide. <clears throat> and then the sprinklers along the ridgeline can be spaced from six to eight feet apart. So basically, those the zone of coverage of those uh, sprinklers, those RE sprinklers under the ridge line would be eight by 24 feet, right? So that's how we've set that up. Then you move on to your next area, your downslope area. We did the same thing. We shaded the, the, the area in question, and then we provided you with all the technical information for installing those downslope sprinklers. And you can see that the downslope sprinkler uh, here, it's, it's sort of a almost a sidewall type sprinkler. Uh, it sprays 20 feet out from out away from the sprinkler in the throw direction down towards the eaves. And then you get, you get a little bit of back spray about four feet back. Again, those sprinklers can be spaced up to eight feet apart. Okay, so again, you've got about an eight by 24 foot zone of coverage for those. But what I wanna do is zoom in on this area here on the downslope area. Here's what's really, really critical with this uh, protection scheme. And this is what makes this work. You'll notice that there's a note here. The DS sprinklers must be offset at least one channel from sprinklers up slope. Uh, preferably it'd be nice if you could center them, but you have to at least be one channel offset from the sprinklers that are uh, located along the ridge line. Okay, and that kind of goes back to that whole channeling Thing and trying to get the sprinklers to uh, be in a proper channel so that we can get operation. But that's a critical uh, point to make here that you do have to offset these sprinklers from adjacent rows. And then as we go uh, move along, we have the same kind of criteria for your hip area, uh, shaded, and here's all your technical criteria for locating those sprinklers in the hip area. What I want to show on the hip area here is, this is what I talked about in the very beginning. There's those jack trusses. As you can see down at the, at the eave coming up, up the hip, and then you have your, your hip trusses, your step down hip trusses running the opposite direction. All right, so that first row off of the eave, you'll see that the maximum spacing we're showing is eight foot between sprinklers. So we've got to keep them fairly tight down there. But then as you get into the adjacent rows moving up the, up the uh, hip, you'll see that we show a 12 foot max between sprinklers. And that's because of that dynamic that occurs where the heat is still trying to get up to the peak, but it's also spreading laterally. So that's, you know, at least you, you kind of understand why that is. The other thing I want to point out, as you look at that protection area of the hip, look at the end sprinklers on each of those rows that's near the hip lines. You can see that one dimension there that says three foot max off the hip line. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have sprinklers that are still near the point of heat trap. Remember, we were looking at how the heat's gonna gather depending on where it's uh, fire starts. We wanna make sure that we have sprinklers near those points of heat trap um, and, and get you know, early operation. So those are some of the parameters you have to look at um, when, when laying these sprinklers out. As far as the hydraulic calcs, I think we've done a really good job of uh, simplifying the hydraulic calcs. Um, so you take a look here at under the gable roof area, uh, for a three branch line design. So this figure right down here, figure 15, this would be uh, for an attic that would be up to 72 foot wide, all right? If this was a wet system, which I know that's uh, limited, uh, most of these systems are probably dry, but for a wet system, what we'd be looking at is calculating for the sprinklers up the ridge line, simulating that those might open in a fire, 
and then one of the downslope sprinklers. Remember I talked about we didn't operate more than one downslope sprinkler in any of our fire tests. Uh, so this test here, or this uh, requirement here for the hydraulics, it's a total of five sprinklers, four of them being up at the peak, all right? And then the next figure over is if the attic's wider. I think the majority of the attics are gonna be 72 feet or less, but you could go out to 96 feet. You've gotta add a few branch lines. Then we look at the figure on the right. Um, this is for a drive system. Again, for that sweet spot with 72 foot wide attics, uh, the tri system calculation is again, four sprinklers up at the peak, but now you're gonna hit two sprinklers along the downslope branch line for a total of six. All right, so wet systems, five sprinklers, tri systems, six sprinklers, max. And then that's sort of how we set up this data sheet. Um, we do give similar criteria for the uh, hydraulic calcs down under the, the uh, hip area. Again, it's five sprinklers wet, six sprinklers dry, all right? Um, just about done here. This uh, this was an attic that uh, I use quite often um, in my uh, when I do presentations. And what I did with this attic was I laid out our new protection scheme, and I wanted to see how it would lay out in this fairly complicated attic. Actually, uh, system demand for this attic would still be, if this was a dry system, would still be about 120 gallons per minute plus a little over discharging. I would still be calculating six sprinklers only. So this would compare to the prescriptive uh, method of five to 600 gallons per minute, and I'd be simulating 30, 30 to 40 sprinklers operating in my hydraulic design area. Uh, that's where, I, where I'm gonna get the five or 600 gallons per minute. The total sprinklers in this system was came out to about 250. If I had designed this for the prescriptive standard, I probably would have been closer to the 400 sprinklers, maybe a little more. So it, it does uh, fit well in many types of attics here, this scheme. All right, with that said, uh, there's been some questions on, on uh, what do I do with 13R uh, type designs? Uh, there, there's some, some new information in the next edition of 13R with regard to sprinkling attics. Uh, some local jurisdictions are requiring attics to be sprinklered in 13Rs, but their issue is, how do I have a contractor sprinkle that attic? They're only calculating four sprinklers on the occupied floors, so system demand of about 80 gallons per minute. But then when they get up to the attic, I want them to sprinkle the attic. How are they gonna sprinkle it? The best they can do is say, well, I'm just gonna throw you back to NFPA 13 in most cases. Well, then you're back to that 500 gallon per minute system demand. And then that blows the hydraulic calcs out, out, out the window because the rest of that building has been calculated for roughly 80, 90 gallons per minute system demand. So. We think there's a, a opportunity here with this uh, listing for possibly four sprinklers, wet or dry, looking at about 80 gallons per minute. We're still gonna, we're still working with UL on this. Uh, we have to negotiate and talk to UL a little bit more about this, but we think there's a possibility here of utilizing this uh, protection scheme for these areas where they want the 13R, 13R attic sprinklers. Um, so we'll see where that one goes. We'll just stay tuned on that one. Um, I think that's that's pretty much it. Now, uh, if we have time for questions, great. But if if, if you don't, or if you have questions uh, moving forward, uh, the technical services phone number out at uh, Standish is 989-414-2600. Our email is techservice at globesprinkler.com. And I'm assuming that uh, Victoria will also be able to ask questions on if you send questions to Victoria. Absolutely. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, listening. Uh, and go ahead, Victoria. No, I was just gonna say thank you. And, and we do have a few minutes left and I do have some questions here. Um, okay. So one of the questions that came in was, was early on, but it was asking, are the NFPA 13, um, attic type requirements that, that you were describing, are the spacing guidelines only required at a specific slope? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think that where they break that is uh, at four and 12 and, a, and above. So when you looked at that, um, that figure that I showed, uh, that uh, uh, trust figure where you had to have the sprinklers that, you know, within one foot of the peak and whatnot, that section uh, that they were referring to was for slopes of, of four and 12 and above. 
I think that answer is that is that what they were asking you think Victoria yeah I think they were just looking for when the rules um, kick in that you were describing yeah. um, and related to that there's a, a separate question that came in asking well what would you do if you had like a two and a half in 12 pitch um, yeah <laughs> yeah you've hit the uh, yeah you know here's the thing uh, up to two and 12 pitch you know, we, NFPA and we as an industry consider that horizontal for all intents and purposes, right? We don't consider it sloped up to 2 and 12. And then we have that blurb that I just mentioned, you know, that section that said, hey, for these concealed spaces with combustible structures uh, at, at 4 and 12 or greater pitch, you, know, you got to do this. So that leaves this gap between, you know, 2 and 12 and up to 4 and 12. Now, you notice our testing was at 3 and 12. We wanted, at least in that first round of testing, we started at 3 and 12 because we had a lot of people come to us and say, what do I do for, hey, I'm at 3 and a half and 12. We actually had people come to us over the years saying, just a little short of 4 and 12. I'm at, you know, so I'm over 2 and 12, but I'm, I'm not quite 4 and 12. And we didn't have an answer for them, to be honest with you. Um, so at least with this, we did drop down to 3 and 12. So now we've lowered that little hole or that little gap so now it's from two and twelve to three and twelve. If you're in that spot, uh, I think you, uh, I'm not sure where we go. We talk to our local authority, I suppose. Okay. Um, someone did ask if there was any ongoing work or research to address steeper slopes, and I, I know you had mentioned it kind of briefly, but they were specific to things in New England, such as twelve and twelves. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Our first go round here was. We're looking at 3 and 12 up to 7 and 12. We are working on steeper slopes right now as part of our program uh, for the back-to-backs and, and also even the REs and the DSs that we just talked about. Uh, but if you look at those specific app uh, sprinklers that are out there now, those back-to-back -back, uh, schemes, um, the Tyco one, well, I guess that's Johnson Controls, uh, Reliable, and Viking. I'm not sure about Reliable. Theirs is up to 6, six and 12 or 7 and or 8 and 12. I think Reliable is up to 8 and 12. Uh, I think the Viking and the Johnson Control scheme for those back-to-back -back does uh, get up to, I think, 12 and 12, okay? And then we are working towards the 12 and 12 ourselves. That's right. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so someone asked, you were talking about the data sheet, and it talks specific application attic sprinklers, and they were asking, what does specific actually mean? Okay, and I used to, you know, if I had more time, I would have went through the whole uh, um, portion of, of the presentation that talks a little bit of, a little bit about how you obtain a specific application listing. So NFDA 13, you know, they categorize sprinklers. Uh, there's different uh, types of sprinklers, and then they have the prescriptive rules within NFDA 13 for spacing and, and, and densities and, and all of that good stuff. But then they have a category of sprinkler that's just called special sprinkler. And that's their way of basically letting the manufacturers go out to the labs and come up with something that's outside or different from what those prescriptive rules are in NFPA 13, such as what we're talking about here, okay, or those back-to-back -back sprinklers. So uh, to obtain a specific application listing, there are certain minimum requirements you, you must uh, meet out at the labs. Uh, it has to do with distributions and, and, and a whole lot of different tests you have to perform out at the labs. And then they'll, the lab, the, the, the uh, UL or FM, whoever you're going to, will provide you with a specific application listing to be used in accordance with the allowance of NFPA 13. So NFPA 13 basically says, hey, if you've got a special sprinkler that has special listing, has gone through special testing, uh, we're not giving you prescriptive criteria within our standard. We're going to leave that up to the labs and the manufacturer after they run their tests. And then they put all of that information into their data sheet. Uh, but we're going to allow for it as long as you uh, obtain that listing from a nationally recognized lab. Great. So they have a few questions that, that came in related to the temperature reading of sprinklers. So one, um, they started out with just what temperature reading for sprinklers was actually used in the, the testing that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, and I, I wish I, you know, uh, could have gone through each page more in detail to, of, of our scheme, but all of these were 200 degrees. We're, 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 uh, our sprinklers uh, that we're using in, for this 
steam will be 200 degree temperature sprinklers. Okay. Um, so then let's see, I have related also to temperature, it says attic ceiling temperature and determining the sprinkler temperature rating um, is the attic ceiling temperature during non-fire conditions correct, is what they were asking. So um, in other words, I guess basically, how do you determine what temperature sprinkler to put in an attic space? Oh, this is just in general. You know, that, that, that's, that's been a, an issue over the years, yeah. That, and I suppose, I mean, you go back to NFPA on that. For, for us, in this special uh, listing, you're going to put in what, you know, what we had, to, what we tested. And again, we, we, all of these are based on 200 degree temperature sprinklers. I think that question might actually be going back to just in general, uh, when you're putting sprinklers in an attic. And, it, you know, it depends on whether that attic is vented or not whether it's in Arizona or an area that, you know, gets really, really hot in the summertime. And then that sort of goes back to that table in NFPA 13. If you can expect the temperature, the ambient temperature in that space to get over, you know, this, um, you know, this temperature range over the course of the year, then they, they put you into, you know, they'll say you either, you know, you might have to move up to intermediate temperature range sprinklers. Um, so, so that just, I would say that falls back to the NFPA 13 uh, 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 table on, um, you know, ambient temperatures in the space that could be expected. Great. But, but as far as our, as far as us, we're offering this with, uh, it's 200 degree period, 200 degree temperature rating. So we are definitely a approaching time and I have a whole bunch more questions, but there, there are two questions here that are sort of related or at least on the same subject um, that I thought we would try and squeeze in before we sign off. Um, one is, is there a change in the maximum water delivery time um, based on NFPA 13 for dry attics? No, not that I know of. In general, uh, for, for our scheme here, if it's a dry system, uh, you're going to have to meet the maximum delivery time that's uh, uh, required by NFPA. Um, I know on one of the, in fact, I'll go back to our Tyco or JCI, uh, now JCI scheme. We had one configuration of back-to-back -back sprinklers where we had a table in there where you had to meet, I think it was a 40 second maximum delivery time if you use that, that, that particular sprinkler uh, in that particular coverage area. But all the rest of them were the standard 60 second delivery time. But as far as uh, no, in general, it's still a 60 second. Oh, in fact, those tests that you saw, that, that fire I ran, and if I was able to show you some more of the videos, uh, we actually ran our fire test. UL requires us to run those tests where we have a 60 second delay. Most of our tests were dry system simulations. So what happened was after the first sprinkler operated, and you saw that one, you know, the fire in that one video, but after the first sprinkler operates, they make us wait a maximum of 60 seconds before they allow any water into that system. And so most of our fire tests were dry, um, were simulating a 60 second delay uh, from the point of first sprinkler activation. Okay, so the last one that I'm, I'm going to try and squeak in here, and, and my apologies to those who submitted questions that we haven't had time to get to, um, but it does say, and I, I think this is kind of important for, for those who may not understand this clearly, but it says um, if there is a fixed flow per sprinkler, you were talking about the 20 gallons per minute for, for each sprinkler, how do you control the pressure of the sprinkler to ensure that you're only flowing that set amount? Uh I don't know if that question is pertaining to during the testing or or just in well, the real I, world after sprinklers start I, activating. I think it's more uh, real world, and and my my interpretation yeah. of how they're asking that was was really is that just a minimum or is it that each sprinkler really needs to hit that twenty gallons per minute? That's a minimum. No, that's a minimum. That's an absolute minimum. And what they do during the testing, and this is historically this this way with any fire test we run at the labs, whether it's storage testing or any type of fire test we run at the labs, they do a really good job of, um, of, of controlling the flow as more sprinklers operate. Now, you're never going to be exactly at that minimum for every sprinkler because you just can't. The dynamics of friction loss in the pipe. But what they do is they're constantly adjusting the water supply as sprinklers operate, and they're trying to keep all of our sprinklers down at the minimum a minimum flow that we're shooting for, okay, or the minimum pressure that we're shooting for as best they can. They do a real good job of it, uh, but it's not absolute, but it's as close as they can get. And that's what we're always uh, held to during our fire test. Even though in the real world, 
when the first sprinkler operates or the second sprinkler operates, you're going to have more pressure and therefore more flow out of those sprinklers than what we uh, saw during the fire test. They try to keep us at the minimums. Um, um, we don't get to take advantage of that during the fire test. Okay? But it, um, and, and so these sprinklers are not area density sprinklers. That's the other thing. This, this scheme here, again, it doesn't matter how or uh, how I space those sprinklers, if I bring the spacing in a little bit closer or if I move it out further, regardless, um, it's not an area, you don't get to adjust your flow based on your uh, area uh, of coverage or the zone of coverage of these sprinklers. It's a fixed flow and pressure. And like I said, you need to meet at least the 20 gallons per minute uh, uh, flow out of these sprinklers. It's gotta be a minimum. Great. Um, so I, I, again, my apologies to those of you who submitted additional questions. I do have a whole bunch sitting here in the queue, um, but we are just out of time for today. Um, there is both phone and email still up on the screen um, to, to contact Globe since they were our sponsors today. And um, Kevin, I just want to thank you again for an outstanding presentation and thanks to everyone who has participated. All right. Thank you, Victoria. And thanks to everybody that's out there listening in. And like I said, go ahead and call the number that you see on the screen or the email and uh, we'll be happy to help you. All right. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, I was really, I was really rushed and trying to rush. I just, if I had, if I knew I had an hour and a half.